Good afternoon, fellow ruminators. Welcome back to another session, Rumination with Andrew. Thank you so much for joining as we are about to discuss a very important topical matter. And so many things are happening in the world, including in Jamaica. And it's almost like our world now has turned into a grand theater, right? Every day there is drama and political theatrics. And we've got to be really alert uh, to what is happening every day and to be asking critical questions. I don't think based on the world in which we live currently that we'll be able to gather any truth. We do not know what is definitive, conclusive truth because a lot of times information is being hidden from the average Joe, right? From the public at large. In the case of Jamaica, we've just learned that Mr. Holdes, first, first we learned that he, you know, was in the, um, in his whole statutory de declarations were in question. And at one point, we wondered if he had actually submitted his statutory, statutory declarations. Um, it seems like he did. The um, Integrity Commission, the IC, they were behaving, pretending as if he didn't. And there was a lot of back and forth. But that is all a part of the theatrix, the drama to distract you and make you not focus on the very issues at hand, right? And to focus on the deep issues. That is how the whole drama and the political machinery is set up for the 21st century. Now, what we're facing also is a dearth of information coming from the media. The media houses, the media outlets in Jamaica are asleep and they seem not to be the watchdog of democracy anymore. They're not informing us. They're not doing any investigative, any deep investigative journalism to allow, to inform the public about what is happening, the events you know, in government. So we can only rely on our politicians to tell us what is happening and they're not going to tell us the truth because we know that in their DNA, um, is corruption. Corruption is a part of the Jamaican DNA, particularly in the political realm. So pol pol politicians are not going to tell you the truth. You know, they'll stand in, 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 in parliament and they lie and nothing happens because they know that if you do not have a functioning press, if you have a fawning press, press rather, then you are not going to be held accountable. So that's what we're seeing right now, that the press no longer desires to unpack and to unveil truth to citizens, so therefore politicians can go scot-free. Now, Ian Boyne wrote a, a, an article some years ago, and this was published, I think I might have read it to you before, in the, in the National Integrity Action. I think he, that was, it, it's on their website. And the title of the article is The Culture of Corruption. Right, And it's, he says here, that's Ian Boyne says, it will take more than legislation, enforcement, changing processes, and institutional change to stamp out corruption in Jamaica. We have a culture of corruption. We have to tackle it at its root. And that's a lot of times we're not tackling corruption at the root. And there is an intimate connection between corruption and every major problem that we face in Jamaica. Corruption stands. Professor Trevor Monroe, a master at making the connection between ideals and everyday reality, used the occasion of the heavy rains and its effects and on the weekend to drive home the point that our citizens need to understand more fully that while heavy rains come from the vagaries of nature aggravated by climate change, exceptionally heavy damage to roads and infrastructure largely reflects the impact of corruption, not the will of God, but the hand of man of corrupt contractors and public officials. So what he's suggesting there is that a lot of times when our roads are not in good condition is because of corruption. It's due to the politics of corruption. And our politicians will tell you that it's climate change and they will cry foul, it's the act of nature. And we're not suggesting here that there are 
not acts of nature and that we do not have from time to time natural disasters. What we're suggesting, a lot of the infrastructure are so weak, right, that they cannot withstand even a very light natural disaster, something that is not strong. But that is the order of the day and something that Jamaicans have not paid close attention to. And as I've suggested before, the watchdog of democracy, the media, have not been doing their jobs. They are asleep. And of course, I think that they have gone asleep because that, you know, by choice, it's not that they don't know what is happening. They know what is happening, but because they are paid well, the ones who are in the upper echelons of the media, then they're not, you know, required, obligated to unpacking the truth to the ordinary Jamaica. So we hear, we see now that, you know, Minister Andrew Holness, the Prime Minister of Jamaica, he seems now to be exonerated of charges about impro impro improprieties, acts of corruption. It seems to me that his um, statutory declarations uh, have gone through and no charges will be um, actually leveled at him because, you know, according to the members of the Integrity Committee, he there is nothing to... There's no evidence, um, uh, you know, there's no evidence in the in his statutory declarations that indicates that he has run foul of the law. That is what they have said. We don't know what is what. We can only take them at their word. Something that is very strange is that the media seem not to be able to grab hold and of things and to be able to have any serious interview done with the members of the National Integrity Commission. Seems to me that that's very weird, that they are an entity to themselves, an institution to themselves, that they can do whatever they want to do, and there is no oversight. Who really investigates the National Integrity Commission? The IC, right? We don't know. Who is there to find out if they are really telling the truth, right? Because there should be someone. The media should be that institution to, to look carefully, to examine what they're telling us to see whether or not it's true. We have to verify facts because no entity should be an entity onto itself. We know that human beings sometimes lack integrity. So even though the institution is called right? The uh, National Integrity Commission, whatever it's called, we know that they too can blunder and perhaps they also have conflicts of interest. So there should be a watchdog, an institution that also examines objectively the pronouncements and declarations of the National Integrity Commission. We should, or there ought to be, because we can't just take them at their word and say that this is what they have said, so everybody should just fall in line. Now, the observer here has a very important um, article. Holness hits back at Integrity Commission finding, says he has broken no law. This is what is coming from the Jamaica Observer. I'm not sure why this is coming now. Let me turn this off. Okay, good. So the National Integrity um, Commission, let me share the, this article with you so that you can see from whence I'm reading so we can have our discussion seamlessly. Okay, so we have here shared, right, good. So this is coming from the Jamaica Observer. It says, Holness has hits back rather at Integrity Commission findings, says he has broken no law. Now we have Prime Minister Andrew Holness has strongly rejected the recommendations of the Integrity Commission that the Financial Investigation Division, the FID, and Tax Administration Jamaica, that is TAJ, examine his financial dealings. The recommendations are contained in a 179-page investigation report into his statutory declarations, which was stabled in the House of Representatives on Tuesday. 
while the commission's director of investigation ruled that no charges be brought against Holness for failing to declare four bank accounts during his statutory filings, the commission raised a litany of questions in relation to bond transactions and loans taken out by companies in which at least one of his sons is connected. Questions were raised about whether the companies were compliant with their statutory filings with the TAJ. In a statement in the House of Representatives on Tuesday, Holness said that let it be known that I have, I'm quoting Mr. Holness now, so let it be known that I have complied with any obligation placed on me within the law. The company with which I am the directly associated, with which I am the directly associated, sounds a little weird here, is compliant and up to date with its tax filings. Why well, use the word that? You know, the company with which I am associated is compliant. Now, the prime minister declared that he has worked hard for what he possesses. And I quote from Mr. Honest, from Dr. Honest, as it were. And I have worked hard, wisely and honestly, to achieve whatever I have. I have never depended on, on the public purse. Those are Mr. Honest's words. He continues, according to Honest, and I continue, this is, um, I, and I quote from Mr. Holness, Dr. Holness, whatever you will, the, weapos the weaponization of accusation of corruption is nothing new in politics. However, even the most skeptical onlooker must conclude that the handling of this matter, the time it has taken, and at the public resources used to pursue it, raise cause for concern on many levels. And he says, suggests, and he continues, while I will not pursue the view that this was politicized, I believe it is commonly agreed that the law governing the IC is urgent or is in urgent need of revision. The current context of its operation does weaken its credibility, and we must do everything to ensure that the appropriate laws are in place to prevent the politicization, the politicization of the commission, right? What am I? Now, he's speaking about the politicization of the commission, but I think this is politics and everything is going to be weaponized. We understand that once you have these two parties, right, that govern, especially when they are hungry for power, they are going to politicize everything. So Mr. Honest cannot avoid in any country whether the United States or England, once you have democratic institutions and you have a two-party system in which they're constantly vying for power, you are going to have the politicization of these reports. What needs to be done while the politicians are politicizing it, the media now need to examine the core facts so that they can divulge these facts to the public. Right. So we are not you cannot escape that. It's almost like we're hearing in the United States where the Democratic Party, you know, responding to Trump's two assassination attempts. They are saying that there is no place for violence, political violence in democracies. But that is not true because we know that violence is a part of the whole political system for years, for decades. We, we've said it on this show, and we're not condoning any form of violence. There should not be. I think that's what they should say. There shouldn't be, but we know that we're not living in a perfect world, and that unfortunately, these things do happen. And that is why politicians have to tone their language down, their rhetoric down, so that, you know, people who are not so sensible and who might be having mental issues, mental problems, suffering from mental traumas, will not attempt to, you know, assassinate any of our political leaders. So we should learn from that. But, you know, we are going to have the politicization of documents like these because the other party wants to win. The opposition always wants to win and always is trying to find something, even though it might not be a valid point or it might not be true, but the opposition always tries to politicize something so that he can gain a political advantage to his constituents, right? That is what happens. That's how democracies work. But it is the importance, it is the role of the media now 
to look carefully, to examine what is happening and to let the public know, just present the raw data to us that we can examine the information for ourselves and see what is true and what is false, not for any laws to come on high telling us that we this is what we need to believe. And this is where our society is moving to now. We have this misinformation and disinformation and whatever comes from on high, whatever comes from officialdom, that is what we should believe. That is what they're suggesting, but that is not how democratic societies run. We know that we cannot trust anyone in a democratic society. And it is good to have a healthy dose of skepticism, right? We cannot just be like robots listening and accepting everything that comes from the um or, or from, from government and from the media not even from the media even though they are the watchdogs and in jamaica it is really a pity that we only have two major media you know the press the media houses in terms of not two major media houses but two um you know we have two major newspapers um we have the jamaica observer and and Jamaica Cleaner. I think we should have had more, right? So we can have more competition. And when you have more competition, you know, you have that the media houses have to, they try to give you a greater understanding, a better understanding of the truth, because, you know, that's how they are going to gain their audience. Now, we do not have much of a competition in terms of the press in Jamaica. They all say the same thing, just like what we're seeing in the United States. That's what, and Jamaica is even worse because we do not have a lot of independent media houses or independent media outlets as you have in the United States. So while the New York Times and the Washington Post and political, you know, they attach themselves to the mainstream media and they might not be divulging the truth. You do have independent media sources that people can, you know, reliable for the most part. And you can go and access some form of, of, you know, factual information and, you know, information built on consistency because the facts have to also be consistent. There can't be something here and something there. Of course, Information might change, but we need to have consistency of what we what are known as the facts. Now, I think that this all of this integrity report is a, a sham. I do believe that there are acts of improprieties. I do not think that our political leaders are clean as they say they are. I think sometimes they do use money from the public purse because... That is how it is. And uh, as you know, Ian Boyne says that political corruption is so much, you know, in our DNA that it's difficult to change us. It's difficult to really transform the political machinery because that is how the system is set up. And they know that they can get away with it and that Jamaicans are not particularly you know, vigilant in terms of ensuring, you know, that their politicians do not participate or engage themselves in these acts of corruption. I think that we are too credulous a population and we believe everything that they tell us. But we have to really ask hard questions. Now, I don't know how many Jamaicans are going to read the 179 document that was published by the National Integrity Commission. I don't think they will ever read that report, that investigation. And how much truth is contained therein? That is a question. How much truth? Because a lot of what we hear sometimes are narratives coming from different people. And, um, and that's what it's all about. But this is all Theatrix and uh, Abila Continua, right? Uh, life continues. There is nothing that is going to come out of this sort of theater, <laughs> right? Nothing is going to come out of it. Um, the PNP likes to talk, and you know, and they're also not, you know, uh, innocent. They too are culpable of corruption, and I'm sure that they're just trying to highlight Andrew Bonus because he's the incumbent government. But when the mantle shall have been given to them which it seems to be that they're going to win the next election, then you're going to hear also charges, corruption charges coming from the JLP, which will then be the opposition, right? If you know they should lose the election. 
uh, the next general government, um, general general elections. That is, we now the GLP is now in power. They are the incumbent, and if they should win, if they should lose rather the elections, um, the next general election, then they will also be, you know, hurling charges, you know, against the PNP government that perhaps will be in power. And that's how the game is actually run. That's how the game is played. We have to be very mindful of that. This morning, there is an article that was written in the Jamaica Gleaner about, you know, I think that I might not be able to access that. So I think I should not bother. Yeah, maybe I'm not able to access it. Oh, but yeah, maybe I'm not. Oh, yes, I am able to access it. The Gleaner is really a weird newspaper. It says cartel. This is an editorial, cartel and the PNP. Oh, it seems like it's not coming up. I will have to close this. Yeah, I'm not going to be able to read this, to read anything from it. But the editorial seems to be castigating the PNP about having cartel, vibes cartel at their, you know, 86, uh, recently held 86 conference of the People's National Party, right? That was interesting because I'm sure the editorial was going to say that the editor of the newspaper was going to say that, you know, these people, they were the ones, you know, through um, Peter Bunting who claimed or who made the assertions that Vibes Cartel was a threat to our nation, right? And yet the leaders, the powers that be actually invited him to their 86 uh, national conference con uh, convention, something that was very, very interesting. But that is how the politics is run in Jamaica. And, uh, you know, criminality is, is the order of the day. And I don't think at this juncture of the history that anything much will change. So, you know, the National Integrity Commission, we applaud you for publishing the document and that can also now be laid to rest and other issues can be solved. But we still do not know who the illicit seven or eight or 10 or 13 are. And I don't think we'll ever know who they are. I think these things just come out of newspaper to sell newspapers because they're saleable, right? But the press knew from a long time ago that nothing was going to come of it because they're not doing any investigation. So how can anything um, come out of this, these situations. It's almost like we're, you know, waiting on the National Integrity Commission to, you know, seriously do investigative journalism. Yes, they are an oversight organization, but they are not the media. And they are not tasked to present us information and to inform us. That's not what the National Integrity, Integrity Commission is tasked to do. So they should allow the media, which they seem not to allow them to do, to have to be an oversight to their organization so that they can inform us. Because, you know, on the National Integrity Commission, they might have their political agenda, as Andrew Holt is suggesting, the politicization of the information, of the information that was given of his statutory declarations. They might have, there might have been some ulterior motive, and it's for the a, a functioning objective media, a non-partisan media, to examine what these facts are and to present it in an intelligent manner to the public, a manner in which they can digest the information. But that has not been done. And that is why the politicians are going to go scot-free. That is why Andrew Holness might have been exonerated from any act of corruption, from any act of impropriety. You know, that is why. And we have got to understand that that is how the system is set up. Corruption, corruption, corruption. Nothing will ever be done to rid us of that cancerous disease, right? Those cancerous cells. Thank you so much for joining. I hope that you will like and you'll share and you'll subscribe. I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Remember now to like the videos and leave a very 
thoughtful and intelligent comment.